numbers. And you can see in the United States, obviously everything's going to be on the West Coast, on the Ring of Fire. Uh, there's the San Andreas Fault right there. The part of this fault is moving, right, or the Pacific Plate is moving this way at about two inches a year. And this plate's moving this way. So the separation, the, the movement between the places is about two inches a year, which is creating about two inches a year of stress. These are all the earthquakes. This is 83. This is through each year. So you realize that we are a hotbed for earthquakes. The big circle is representing very, very large quakes. And one thing I'd like you to notice, if you can, I'll see if I can pull in a little closer here. But in this zone here, this is the triple juncture where they're piling up right in there. And that's the, my biggest, my area of biggest concern is that, because that's on the south end of the um, Cascadian um, subduction plate, which is a, a mega thrust fault, which is basically why we have the Mount Laos and Mount Shasta all the way up into Rainier and Baker. It's a subduction zone. And the potential for big quakes exists on that zone. The last big one was a couple hundred years ago, last real big one, um, but they're due. They're due, and they figure there's a big one every couple hundred years. And that's the one that will produce a 9.0. That's the one that will produce significant um, tsunami potential. And that's the one that could cause problems for Calif big problems for California, obviously. Um, but I think in terms of water, in terms of the potential for um, uh, the tsunami event. So here's the ring of fire, and this is California right here. There's the triple point right here. This is the Juan de Fuca plate, which is the subduction zone, which is going this way. Pacific plate's going this way. North American plate's going kind of this way. And they all merge into each other. It's a convergence zone. And if you notice, subduction, again, represents land that is sinking and getting hot. So it's being pushed under the North American plate. And it heats up and it bubbles up as Mount Lassen, as Mount Shasta, as um, Mount McLaughlin, as um, Mount Bachelor, as the Sisters in Oregon, Rainier, Baker, all those. And you can see all the way through Alaska, all the way across the Pacific, all the way just North Australia, South America, or South America. So it's a very hot and active zone. And that's where most of your earthquakes are in this what we call the Ring of Fire, and uh, we're right there, and we're in probably one of the most high-risk parts of the Ring of Fire based on population and proximity to ocean. This is the, the last, this is today. This is the, the number of quakes. This is, well, actually, pardon me, the yellow, the blue ones are today, the two, and then the three, the yellows are the past week. So all in all, in the last seven days, you've had seven earthquakes, not giant, but it just shows you that, that that's the triple point. That's where the three plates meet, and they're just bubbling. They're, they're converging. They're clashing, and they're moving. They're constantly moving, and that's something you can't stop. And that's why I can say with complete confidence that we're going to have ourselves another big earthquake, and not that we're not that far off. We really aren't. Um, and so I guess being prepared, I mean, I'm not going to go into the whole get a bunch of batteries, store water and stuff, but I think the biggest thing is be aware that it's going to happen. And lots of things have changed. There's been lots of infrastructure upgrades in the marina, for instance, in San Francisco, in private homes. After 89, people went to town on the sheer wall, right? Um, people went to town on, you know, stirring up buildings that were in sediment, which is, you know, low-lying areas, river basins along the bay where the things people have really made gone to the great effort of putting um, hard pilings into hard rock in San Francisco. All those new buildings are, are into rock. So it'll shake, but there is, it should not liquefy. So I think it's a very different story than 89. I saw the freeways come down. I saw the Cypress structure. Um, I saw the Bay Bridge, you know, partially become prop compromised. But things have gotten better. So if you're, again, if you're not a towner, and you're worried about this, be worried. But I have to tell you, I've been in every earthquake since 1958. I don't remember this because I was teeny, but I've been a lot. And they're pretty awesome, especially if you're just calm down and go, okay, here we go. Because you got a P wave that's really loud at first, and then you get this S wave that comes through that starts the shaking. And they can last a minute to two minutes. I remember in San Francisco when the buildings were moving, when I was watching them, I remember them when the earthquake ended, they kept going. Because, right, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, an entropy, right? It just... They were going. They kept moving. They would not slow down. And they, and they finally did. But it took, I'll bet it, it felt like it took two minutes for the buildings to stop swaying. 
I know. And then the other thing, I was on Vanessa, that was a bunch of car dealers back in the day, and car alarms had just come out. And the thing I remember most was car alarms <clears throat> was everybody's car, every, all the new cars had car alarms. So all, it was just these noises I'd never heard because they were brand new. Car alarms were brand new. So it was like nonstop. It used to be they'd honk, it'd honk the horn, I think. I think it still does do that, doesn't it? Um, and then the other thing I remember is people coming out of the buildings kind of shocked and dazed. And you see that in some of the video I showed you and some more I'll show you, that there's this sort of, it's, just, it's a shock you go into, even when it wasn't that big. 89 was big, but it wasn't that big. I didn't think so. I mean, we shook pretty good. My car bounced and stuff, but um, yeah. So anyway, just here it comes, right? So here's the triple point. Triple juncture is called. That's where most earthquakes occur. And the subduction zone is from about Cape Mendocino or, as I said before, Mount Lassa northward. That's subduction zone. But that is subduction zone is where we could see the biggest quake because of this. The, the Pacific plate dives under the North American plate. And what happens is it dives and it pushes the, the North American plate, which is denser and harder, pushes it back and just loads it up, like pushing on a spring, just just and then it pops land goes up water goes up tsunami big earthquake so i this area right here potentially the most um to me the most scary part of earthquakes in california the other reason is is because the amount of time from an earthquake to a wave hitting um bolinas or hitting um half moon bay uh hour hour and five minutes that's just that's not a lot of time it sounds like a lot of time but by the time we figure out there's an earthquake up there because we may not even feel it probably you'll feel it but may not but if there's a 9-0 up there you'd feel it but you it would take about you know an hour to get here they move about 500 miles an hour and in this zone up in northern california crescent city del Norte, Humboldt, up to uh brookings and in um coos bay five minutes, eight minutes, not very long. So it definitely takes takes some pre-preparedness, I guess you would say. Um, here is the sinking. This is just reiterating the seafloor dives. It gets hot down here. The mantle is hot. And this air, this heat heated magma melts and comes up as volcanoes. That's how the volcanoes are formed. That's why they call it the Cascadia subduction zone. So it does a lot of things. It creates volcanoes. It creates in here, see this area here? That's that area that's going to get drawn back because this is constantly pulling it. And this just gets wound up tighter and tighter and tighter. And then boom, boom, it pops. And when it pops, that's when you get your big earthquake, potentially upwards of a nine. And that's when you get the big seafloor or ocean um, um, dispersal or what would you what's the right word for that um displacement so this is an interesting map this is the cascadia quake this is on the cat the on the on the subduction zone this was reconstructed around 1700 and this shows the wave that comes off of it and how it propagates so this is four hours in it's all the way to mexico in four hours it's all the way to hawaii in six hours it's all the way to japan in seven hours and it's big, and it just rumbles. And the, in, Jap in Japan, which tsunami means harbor wave, that's what it essentially means. In Japan, they called it a ghost wave because they didn't feel an earthquake. They're used to having, because they have their own subduction zones. They didn't realize it came from over here. Of course, 1700 was a long time ago, but pretty good sized tsunami. And if you look at these dark reds, that's representing 30 plus feet of ocean water coming in. That's a lot. That's a whole lot. So that's the potential. And, and again, that's a nine point, I believe it was, what was that one? That was a nine, hmm, I think it was a nine two. And that is incredibly possible to see in this area, especially coming out of this zone here. So most of the potential earthquakes on the San Andreas are going to be less aggressive. They're big and they can be long and last, but typically you're not that it's that subduction and that spring loading you'll get that in a transcurrent fault which is the san andreas but you're going to see it's not quite as abrupt right you're, the strains are building up they probably have more of an opportunity i would uh, imagine to release a little bit of stress and tension as each each movement occurs whereas that subduction you're just loading it loading it and now not to say you're not building up stress and strain 
on the um, San Andreas Fault, but it's I think the subduction zone has the potential to produce a much bigger quake. So, and I, and I think that's correct. So 120 years of earthquakes and tsunamis. I love this map. This shows, first of all, the size of the circle is how big the darn earthquake is. It's not gonna give you numbers. This is 1902, and we're going all the way through the last 100 years or so. And that purple, that's a tsunami. So about every couple years, you're getting a big earthquake on the ring of fire, right? That's those areas. You're getting a big earthquake. It'd be another tsunami. This one's the one that kind of freaks me out here. You'll see it. See, I'll stop it when it happens. Um, boom, that. So what do you got? What happened there, right? That's big tsunami up in the Gulf of Alaska or actually for up towards, um, gosh, all the way up into the Aleutians. And then this earthquake down here, and it's throwing, it's like, two tsunamis. I mean, can you imagine what that must have been like? That was 1923. Um, and it, it doesn't look like, it looks like it missed a lot of the West Coast of California. But I mean, I can't even imagine what was going on in that in that world. So again, these earthquakes are nonstop over 120 years, and then go a few more years, you wait, and then you'll see a big dot, and then you'll see the tsunami. And I think you'll see the San Francisco or the, um, ooh, there's a big one. And you see the, 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 the fingers reaching out, indicating a wave of over 20 feet, maybe 30 feet, the big dark purples. And then you can see the triple point here lighting up occasionally. And then this is Alaska, and that's 48. And then I'll show you, I'll stop in Alaska 64, because I was actually up there for that tsunami. So you get an idea, it's not, it's, these aren't rare events. I mean, they used to seem rare to me, I guess, because uh, I just I wasn't really completely um, savvy to what was going on here and looking at a chart like this. But these aren't this is not rare. It's not rare to see a tsunami. It's 120 years. That's it's in our lifetime. It's rare. But in geologic time, it's, it's nothing. This is the Alaskan quake. Well, let me go backwards. I think the Alaskan quake is 64. Let's see if I can hit it up. I just want to stop there because I was actually in Fort Bragg when this happened. And we spent the night in a campground. So I've been in a lot of big earthquakes. I, was, I wasn't in the Alaskan quake lasted over a minute in the tsunami. We were in the, in the tsunami zone. Um, and it, I remember loud noise at night. I think we were camping. Um, and it, must, it was sounded like rushing water. But it's hard. I was only like six or seven years old. But when we went to the beach the next day, I have pictures somewhere around here. Uh, the beach was just, of course, nobody at the beach. The, listen, this is before the internet. This is before cell phones. So nobody knew anything. We didn't know anything, and we didn't expect to know anything. I and mean, even the car radio wasn't really working because, well, first of all, Dad wouldn't listen to the radio, which always pissed me off. I'm like, why, why can't we just listen to some music, man? We had to talk. <laughs> so we know it's awesome, but we didn't really know. So we went down to the water's edge, and you could the thing I remember that was most stunning was the amount of debris, tree trunks, trees, just everything was kind of stacked way up on the bluffs. There was just driftwood just got, and you can imagine this slosh of water going through. Crescent City had um, a certain amount of, of uh, people, lives lost, damages done to infrastructure. Um, and I didn't, I think I mentioned this, I don't know if I did, but the Petrolia quake, that, that Ferndale Petrolia period in 92, they had three, pretty good sized quakes uh, within a few minutes of each other. And so it was sort of like a multiple event. So just wanted you to see that map because it makes you very aware. It makes you realize, oh, okay. This is um, 1964. So this is the, the Alaskan quake. And this is going to show the, um, the movement of a tsunami and how quickly it would or did get to San Francisco. It went into Tiburon and unmoored a bunch of boats. Didn't have a good angle on the place, but I'm going to click it right there. And you're at four hours. So not a lot of lead time in six. Like I said, people, I'm sure there was people didn't know there was a tsunami coming. And then you can see it kind of linger and moving across the ocean. Um, and then you see the refraction and the reflection of the waves. So, yeah, I mean, that, that triple point has me a little bit worried. I remember this shot. Well, this is the Bay Bridge. Um, and I could see how that would happen. And people were kind of fleeing. People, people that were out that told me that were out on the bridge that day were kind of running. And there's a lot of general panic because I can imagine, I wasn't on the bridge, but I can imagine the bridge was um, swaying quite a bit. So what did I just say? It's fires, earthquakes, drought. 
we're talking about earthquakes today. That's kind of what it's all about. If we get a big one, it's going to come from that triple point. If we get, uh, we'll still see some good sized quakes from the east, from the Cascade, or from the uh, San Andreas, certainly, because it's partially that is the San Andreas fault. Um, but just be prepared for it. And don't, I was in two, my, my dad and both my grandpas were in the big quake. And the stories, if you're in the, if you're, if you're not, if you don't panic, you're going to be fine, generally. Um, not these pictures are showing doom and gloom, which is horrible. The Cypress structure was horrible. That's right by Channel 2, where I work, where I did work recently. Um, so anyway, yeah, yeah. Subduction zone, Cascadia, Cascadia subduction zone, uh, mega thrust fault has the highest potential for a giant earthquake. And it's due. I know. Okay, I'll see you back here.